Ladies and gents, when you think about becoming a poker crusher, you probably remember some of the more dramatic YouTube videos you've watched over the years. You may have watched videos along the lines of, Can you find this 5x pot jam like Linus? And you know, players like the really famous guys like Linus and Stefan and Barry Sweet and whoever else, sure, they're finding giant river bets for value as a bluff. Stuff like that. They're doing stuff that you wouldn't do. They're doing solver-esque stuff that you probably wouldn't even consider. And they're doing it in lots of aggressive ways. But they're also, consider this, they're also checking in spots that you would bet but are actually really good to check. So this is a real hidden source of EV. If we can learn where checking is actually really great, and this could be check calling, check folding, check raising, even checking behind, we can level up our game with some very low hanging fruit. Let me show you what I mean in this video. All right, first hand here we have pocket aces. This is an open from the cutoff and we three bet on the button. Cutoff goes for the four ball. This is a normal sizing. It looks quite reggy to me. If this was 24 or something and it reeked of recreational player with a good hand, we would just fast play the aces, but I think just going for the more GTO-centric play of calling here is good, especially since people are beginning to get more and more aggro with their 4-bet bluffs and in 4-bet pots in general these days in the mass data phase. So we were confident this was a reg, and if you're confident that this is a reasonable player, I think slow playing here is good. The worse your opponent gets, as I say, the more you just want to fast play the pocket rockets. Remember they used to be called that? Do you guys remember that? Or was that before your time? Let me know in the comments. But we used to fast play this hand all the time pre here, but now we just, um, you know, GTO's shown us that slow playing aces is pretty damn good at low SBR in position against the polarized range. Who would have thought? A6-3. I feel like I always flop top set, guys, whenever I flat a 4-bet with aces. It just seems to always happen. And this is a somewhat of a blood from a stone situation where we're wondering how do we get paid here? King, Queen, King, Jack is very likely at this point, like some 4-bit bluff, we block most of the aces, only the blue one, the diamond one remaining. We may just be coolering ace-king sometimes, or ace-five or something, but more likely our opponent has kings, queens, jacks, tens, or a bluff here. And when they check the flop, I would say their range will shift more towards like the pocket pair, but they do just go for quarter pot here. By far the most popular way for regs to play this texture, for good reason. We call if you raise here. It's not even that you don't deserve to play the game. It's probably that you should uninstall all of the poker clients and maybe even sell your computer and ban yourself from all kind of stra strategic online activities for a few months, something like that. Anyway, assuming that you've, you've done that and it's three months later and you're now back, back at it, learning from this video where you left off. Well done, by the way, for taking the three month break. And let's move on to the turn. The turn is the seven of diamonds, villain checks, and we decide to check back. So this is where the power of checking comes in. This is a pretty obvious check, I think. I don't think there's any Nobel prizes for this check. But the idea is obviously that villain's range is basically split into two camps. And we talk a lot at Carrot Corner about hand versus range thinking. And that's not to say that we don't also understand our own range here, like we do. We have an awareness that when we check back this turn, we very often have jacks or tens or nines or something like that, or king queen of hearts, or some hand that's waiting to bluff river. Maybe we just have like ace queen that's just biding time. And then we have aces. We understand all of that, but that's not really very relevant to what this hand should do. The thing that affects what aces should do is, well, aces and our opponent's range and strategy and likely um, conceptions, like how they're going to, going to look at the spot. So when we check back here, and I made a point of checking back relatively fast here in game, just to not like send any alarm bells off. I don't want to tank for like 30 seconds and then check back. That's just weird. Maybe that's a good play with tens to not get bluffed on the river. I don't know. You tell me in the comments. But I think aces here is just a very clear check because our opponent's range is either going to be stuff like king, jack, king, ten that will bluff the river at a non-zero frequency on average, or it's going to be something like ace, queen that we can just stack anyway, whatever happens, or it's going to be something like queens or kings which at SPR1 we can still jam river and sometimes get called. So I don't think the bet and then jam river line makes any sense with this hand. We're just forcing villain to fold all of their air give ups and we're making so much money from the rest of their range anyway by slow playing that this is a very clear check behind spot. On the river villain goes for one tenth pot and I expect this to be just bet size equals hand strength as it should be in theory, you know. The sizing should come from hands like jacks or queens or something like that. I think they could maybe even go slightly bigger than this. But yeah, this is probably not ace-king really ever. That's just going to get greedy and go bigger. This is probably a bluff very occasionally, like maybe even less than the pot odds here. I think this is just a showdown value hand about 95, 96% of the time, something like that. 
So even though you need 8% equity here, calling this bet with like king-queen is probably a losing proposition. But we don't have king-queen, we have aces and we have a really easy jam. And there's not much to say here. Villain tanked for 52 seconds. Something like that. I swear it was something like 52 seconds here and eventually called with the pocket kings. And, and I mean, this makes some sense because from Villain's point of view, we're saying we have an ace. I think we can probably jam any ace on the river, but a lot of people won't find a jam with like ace five or something like that. So I guess we're saying we have like ace jack suited plus in real life here. That's what people expect to see. Oh, ace five is a straight. I think people will find the jam with that given it's the nuts. But yeah, I can see why King's Calls here. It's a little bit suspicious. There are definitely some bluffs that can just check back and jam river. Or a hand like eights might just check back turn and then decide it doesn't want to get milked on the river and might spew and freak out. There's also a, a cult of poker thought that talks about betting small to induce mistakes. And, you know, the thing is, like, if you're very confident the spot's over bluffed when you bet small, that logic holds. If in this spot, however you're not that sure, then betting small to induce doesn't really make sense unless you think it's going to be overbluffed. So this villain clearly didn't know what was going to be overbluffed or didn't have a clear game plan of what to do against the jam here because they tanked for 52 seconds, right? So there's no way they could have been doing that. But given that people do that sometimes, sometimes that gets in their head and they're like, oh, maybe I induced something and then they call it off. So yeah, this call with Kings is, I don't think it's that unreasonable, but in this pool in general, it's probably not the best idea. Okay, ace king here. We go for an open. We're called called by button. We get a flop in 984 two tone. We start with the check here. I think this is mandatory. This is basically a board that we'll be playing a, a close to range check strategy on against a good player. And against a recreational player, we'll just be betting a few hands that we don't really want to check fold, but you know, checking most other stuff, anything we can check call or check raise, we're going to be checking here. Against small sizing or big sizing, it doesn't really matter. You're going to be calling with this combo king of hearts, ace king, not bluff catcher, not pair draw. Very nice hand to continue with. You're not going to be folding yet. Going for check call again on the turn. Still with bluff catcher properties. Showdown value on the river is pretty good, but not good enough that we can value bet. So we go for a check again. Villain goes with this sizing and we raise. We raise to 47.75 big blinds. My idea here is just that, well, villain's range is highly capped. I have maybe, maybe nines and eights, although I feel they're quite likely to check raise flop but definitely queens, kings, aces that would want to check raise to this sizing. Villain, on the other hand, has a lot of 10-9, ace-9, 9-8, 8-7, pocket 10s, pocket jacks, pocket 6s, pocket 7s, hands that are just going for a little bit of value on the river here. So given that we have a completely uncapped range here and Villain has a capped range, and given that this is a play that, I don't know, it's it's probably one of these spots, honestly, where... It doesn't work as well in real life as it should. Like, I don't even know what I think about this because, like, against the right opponent, this is absolute gold dust. And against, like, a bad recreational player, this is just trash because you're asking them to fold a boat. You're asking them to fold what we call absolute hand strength, right? Where they have full house to jacks. So, I don't know. This play might just be bad and we should probably just call here in real life. But my kind of GTO brain took over for a minute here and was like, wait a minute! We have the King of Hearts. I don't think that's particularly good because flushes could easily be bet folds here and wouldn't check the turn anyway. So basically that thought is a non-starter. I don't think it means anything. And yeah, I don't know what I think of this play. You can let me know what you think. I think it's a little spewy. I think Call is probably just performing really well here. But against the right player, this is good. But I didn't know this opponent at all. I think against the right sort of passive GG reg, though it's okay, and there are quite a lot of those floating around. So it's probably all right, but call might be better. And if this is a recreational player, it's a little dicey. That's what I'll say about this line. The 9-4 of hearts always defend the 49 of hearts. I don't care what your charts say, guys. There's no way this is a big punt to defend to min. We flop a flush draw. See, I told you it was fine. And if you do think you've got a skill edge, and this is a, a recreational player, by the way, and we did think that because we do think we're better than a rec player in the pool, you know, might not be the best player in the world, as some of you like to point out. I might not be a high-stakes baller. But I do think I'm better than an average rec player at 100 rushing cash by quite some margin. So we do peel the 49 of hearts, and we do go for check raise here. I think this is just obviously normal. I'd lean towards raising in these spots, guys, just because I think it's over C-bet and under-defended. King 6-5 probably gets bet 60% of the time or something in theory here. Maybe 65 it's not going to be a range bet. People are range betting. They're then struggling to defend. This is cash injection exploit 101, by the way. So definitely recommend just raise here as a default. But, you know, you should 
theoretically be calling at some frequency as well if you want to play GTO, which you don't, which you don't. But anyway, this is a good sizing for the turn. I don't really have much to say on this hand. I just threw it in because I think it's an instructive turn size, just setting up something big here. When you're deep, you could even go a bit bigger. But because my hand doesn't really river nutted, I decided not to bother. If I had a nut flush draw here, I think it makes a bit more sense to like overbet and stuff. And this is just an example of like playing your hand, finding a good sizing for your hand against your opponent's range and strategy. I'm very content just betting 40 into 60 on the river here. If I river a flush, it's not the kind of spot where I want to shove all in if I river a flush because I just don't have the nut flush draw. So the, the rule here is basically that the more nutty your hand is at deep SPRs, the more you want to set up SPRs that facilitate playing for stacks. And the less nutty your hand is, the more you want to, might want to put it into like a pot sizing instead of a, a 1.5x pot sizing or, or whatever. So just a small overbet there is good, I think. Ace King of Clubs now. We have a flop of seven for deuce. And we are, where are we? Hijack against Big Blind. Billin leads. Okay. We decide to call. The turn is a 10 and Billin leads for an overbet. Okay, this is a little bit scary, but I mean, we have the nut flush draw and we probably have some pretty good implied odds against sets and stuff like that. And we call, and then we hit a king on the river and villain checks. And your initial instinct in spots like this is always going to be to value bet. But don't forget a key fact. Your opponent just overbet the turn. Would they do this with like jacks or ace 10 or something? Maybe, but it's a bit weird to lead the flop big with ace 10. So if this isn't jacks exactly, and it might just be jacks like a lot of the time, but I feel like this is a bit big for jacks. I don't think people are doing this with jacks that often in this pool. This river check kind of creeped me out a little bit. And I remember thinking here, okay, if I bet this river and villain is slow playing some sets here, which they will be occasionally, like what am I actually getting called by? Like I have the king of clubs, so it's not like he could have had the king high flush draw and just hit the king on the river. What other overbet bluffs contain a king? There really aren't any. And it just wouldn't shock me to see someone trapping here sometimes. So I just figured there's very little I get called by here if I make a big bet. Jax might not even call, even if it is there. And if you're playing against like a really straightforward player that you think is just, you know, you're just always winning here, then of course you should value bet. And if this turn sizing had been anything else, then we would value bet the river. But you need to understand that when your opponent's range polarizes like this, it becomes way more dubious to just go ahead and value bet into a formally polarized range. So I decided to check back here in position closing the action. And I quite like this play because something just smelled off here. I just smelled a rat. And sure enough, Villain did have the walking sticks. So turns out that I can dodge walking sticks, baby. Yeah. Let's go with that. King, Queen of Hearts now. This is the final hand we're going to talk about today. So that last check is all about preserving chips in spots where it's hard to get value and you're still losing to the nut sometimes it's basically like understanding that checking against the polar range is a good thing to do just in principle this hand is more about damage limitation in a nitty pool so this hand's gonna four bet a lot in game theory but when you face this three bet i think the passive line is just automatically good this isn't so much a hand about the check button but just about the more passive options in general so king queen of hearts here is a hand that I don't really want to 4-bet against a 9-BB 3-bet because this is usually just going to be a recreational player with a really strong range. And sometimes in this spot, they're 3-betting 3 or 4% instead of 6 or 7 or 8 or whatever a reg would average out at there. So I think the 4-bet option is already out, but with a hand as good as King-Queen suited, we of course do want to call here and take a flop. Queen-8-3, I think raising here is just disastrous. This is a really easy call. We're already kind of unhappy due to the configuration though, so I think... One thing that will make hero folding, or just folding, right? Folding is always kind of heroic when the pot's big because you have to say no thanks to a growing pot. You have to say, yeah, like I, I've already put in all this money. There's a sunken cost fallacy going on as humans are always slaves to that, even though we like to pretend we're not. We are absolute suckers for sunken cost fallacy, the idea that when you've thrown a lot of resources into something, you can't let it go. And that's why when you get to the river here and villain triples and you should absolutely fold 200 big blinds deep in that spot if you face a triple barrel like there's no two ways about it that can still feel difficult and it can feel grim but if you begin on the flop here or even pre-flop hell let's go back to pre-flop and begin by saying we're unhappy if you can acknowledge this is not a good spot for you and just say okay this spot is worse than normal it's probably still a call but honestly it's not great and it's probably close to zero ev that already primes you for just like being realistic about how bad your hand is later in the, the light of continuous aggression. 
And then on flop again, you just kind of say, this is bad. I'm probably taking the worst of it here, but for 2.5 to 1 and 29% required, I'm going to go ahead and make this call. But I understand it's bad. I'm under no illusions. And I think I should maybe even fold the turn here. And I get what you're thinking. And I'll tell you why I didn't fold the turn ultimately. But you're probably thinking you can't fold top pair. It's too tight. It's too tight. It's a blunder. And when you say that, you're not really opening your mind to the full extent of the exploit. And maybe this is a call, right? But I think this is super close already. Because here's the thing. This is a recreational player in early position, double barreling a flush turn in a three bit pot. And when you put all of that together into one narrative, it sounds like a horror story, right? It sounds really scary. And that's how you should perceive the situation. A weaker player barreling the turn in a three bet pot in an early configuration on a flush card. That's like many, many nails in the coffin there. So holding this hand, which is dead when behind and probably not that far ahead when ahead because villains bluffs here are like ace king with a with ace of spades or something is probably good. The reason I didn't fold, and this might be a valid reason and it might be a sufficient reason, but I don't, I don't think it's by much. I think it's close. The reason I didn't fold is that villain may be merging here with hands that appear to have something going on, but they're not very nutted. And I think this is enough of a reason not to fold. You will see weaker players merge with jacks with a spade, nines with a spade, tens with a spade, queen jack suited at some non-zero frequency. And that's probably enough to peel here, but this is a grim spot. And lo and behold, our opponent checked back top set on the river. So I'm not kidding when I say there are some really nitty recreational players in this pool and that that turn spot is already really grim for us with king-queen. So some of checking and like understanding passivity and understanding non-investment is really about accepting that your hand strength isn't all it's cracked up to be, that your absolute hand strength is basically higher than your relative hand strength or true EV hand strength. So going ahead and folding here, I think, is is not ridiculous, although maybe this is a marginally winning call. And yeah, other reasons for checking, as we saw, could be that you think your opponent's range is too polar to value bet. We saw that, just to summarize, in this hand here, where after the turnover bet donk lead, we just didn't believe that, one, that we were doing that well, and secondly, that there were many hands villain could call with. It looks like miss draws and traps, mostly, on the river after that turn sizing, with the exception of maybe pocket jack. So that's just hand reading 101. And then other reasons for checking are when there's low urgency, right? Like you don't have to rush pot growth, like on the turn here with pocket aces, and you can just go ahead and play your hand kind of normally. Another reason to check is that you have showdown value, but that doesn't mean that you can't start bluffing later. Although I think this one is slightly iffy, and I think call is probably better, but this is an interesting one for sure that we can discuss in the comment section, and you can berate me for if you so please. But do remember to use your best chat pro voices. We are almost ready to give you an official launch date for our subscription service. I've been recruiting even more powerhouse crushers. We have a bunch of high stakes, really strong poker players already signed up and recording videos. I'm super stoked. I'll be in touch with a date for that very soon. It's not just my true EV series you've got to look forward to, but also content from all those other players as well. And I'm, I'm super excited. So launch date coming imminently. And yeah, let me know what you think about this video. We'll be back with more next week. Bye-bye.